So let me first introduce uh, Ana Elio. Ana Teixeira de Mello is a researcher at the Center for Social Studies, University of Coimbra in Portugal. And she's a PhD in clinical psychology by the University of Coimbra. She conducts interdisciplinary and action research focused on themes of family and community well-being, change and resilience processes, and investigates all these topics from a complex systems perspective. She investigates complex thinking applied to the management of change in real-world complex systems, as well as inter- and transdisciplinary process, namely in relation to creativity and abduction. Leo is an independent researcher based in New Porto in Portugal. He was formerly a senior lecturer in systems biology at the University of York, where he was a founder of the York Center for Cross-Disciplinary Systems Analysis. He's a research associate at the University of York to this day, and a collaborator of the Center for the Philosophy of Science at the University of Lisbon. He did his postgraduate studies on the Philosophy of Children program at the University of the Açores recently, uh, which has a practice-based community-focused ethos, and has been working on systemic worldview, process metaphysics, multi-embodied cognition, and cybernetic epistemology. And they will talk to us about environments and epistemically potent environment for complex noise, as you, see, you can see in the first slide. So I'll leave the floor now to you, Anna, who will uh, make the talk. Uh, so please, thank you again. Oi a todos. Hi to everyone. Um, I'm going to be um, doing this presentation on behalf of myself and, and, and of Leo. Leo will be chipping in as needed and supporting, and then we'll open the wider conversation. If you can, uh, if you can't, that's fine. But if you can, I would ask you to share your screens because we will be talking a lot about relationships and couplings and interactions. And it will be easier for me to couple with you if I can see you too and 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 and, and to follow through. So so thank you those that, that can share because then I can I can have more information <laughs> to modulate my own uh, presentation. Uh, because we will be talking about environments. Uh, and epistemically potent environments. So um, this is a very uh, experimental work and it's very much a work in progress that, that we've been developing. So we'll be welcoming the discussion later on and, and the contribution for us to refine a bit of this work because there are a couple of very key points that we wanna cover. And there was a lot of uh, theoretical framing that would be needed for us to get there afraid never to get to the point, we decided to flip this presentation. So we're going to cut to the chase and we'll go directly to the message that we want to convey. And then uh, assuming that some of these concepts might be familiar to many of you, but some may not be. So if in the end, some of these concepts don't make sense or you need some clarification of their background, we have a couple of extra slides and we can go back to that. But we're kind of like we're going to be cutting through some of the basic definitions or or or, or theoretical frameworks just to make sure that we can convey um, our ideas. But we do need to talk a little bit about concepts and what do we mean and why is it that we're talking about uh, complex knowings and what do we mean by this? Right. So you notice that we're not using the word knowledges; we're using the word knowings because we're not so much focusing on the outcome of a knowledge production system that's just fixed or static or final but we're interested about that kind of knowledges that are capable of evolving, that are dynamic, that open up a wider array of possibilities for action and that realize emergence through novelty and surprise, that adapt, that co-evolve in a wider landscape of possibilities for action. So if you want these complex knowings, we'll also include the capacity to learn or higher order learnings or second order learnings. How, how do we keep these knowings dynamic and evolving and ecosystemically fit? And we will be talking about uh, epistemically potent environments, and that, that's our target concept, assuming that when we're talking about this potency, we're always talking about a relative concept, okay? Something is epistemically more or less potent in relation to something else, but I will be talking as if this concept is absolute, but it will be between brackets, okay? The, 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 what, the what as if. So what we will be discussing today is the notion of epistemically potent environments and their role in generating these complex knowings. A lot of what we're saying can probably be applicable to any dimensions of our lives and to any dimensions of our everyday living. We will be applying it and focusing our conversations in context of inter- and transdisciplinarity and production of knowledge in inter- and transdisciplinarity context because that's our main uh, field of, of application. 
So uh, a key concept in understanding complex knowings or key concepts are going to be the concepts of creativity and the concepts of abduction that probably some of you are familiar with. We consider creativity and abductions as a sort of hallmarks of the complexity of our thinking processes as they represent the emergence in that thinking process. Different authors define creativity in different way, but we could talk about forms of creativity that are more exploratory, where, where you have variation, uh, some forms of creativity, you'll have a little bit of innovation or changes of states. And then um, someone says that I'm not sharing my screen. Is that it? I'm no, gonna... you are sharing your screen. Am I? Uh, it's okay. okay. It's shared for okay, me. Sorry. So probably it's so, at the end of the yeah. So we have these forms of creativity that are more combinatorial, but we also have forms of creativity that are transformational where that which changes uh, leads to a, a deep change in the modes of being in the whole landscape of possibilities for action. And abduction is slightly related to creativity, but it relates to a form of amplier type of difference. Some would also say a perception or an instinct that underlies the logic of discovery as uh, first proposed by Peirce, but also developed by other authors. So we'll be considering these two things as indicators, if you want to, also of the complexity of the knowing or hallmarks of the complexity of that knowing process. And we're interested in creating these complex knowings. So habitually, interventions in the context of knowledge creation are, are, are focused either on the level of the individuals. We have intervention, educational interventions on the individuals or educational interventions in their environments. I'm we're going to be talk a lot about four E perspectives of cognition, and in the end, we can elaborate a bit more. But this idea that cognition is embodied, the foundations of cognitions are embodied, are enacted, embedded, and extended. And in the context of the enacted perspective, also of these kind of interventions, many authors have proposed a fuller engagement of the whole body in this context of interventions in knowledge formation. But less frequently, the interventions are designed to keep a focus on the generative dynamic coupling process through which both an entity and its environment are transformed uh, in, in the coupling with each other and where the creative and abductive process, processes take place. So they're often either on the intervention or, uh, or either on the um, individual or on their environment, sometimes in their interaction, but we're talking about that kind of dynamic process through which both an entity and its environment are co-defined and through which they co-arise. So from this perspective, interventions in the field of knowledge formation could be considered as practices of gardening. We have explored the concept of gardening as a metaphor for interventions in complex systems in the context of another work, where we see gardening as, as a process of managing, of tending, of nurturing, of mapping, and of managing configurations of relations in the context of, relative, of, of high complexity and relative uncertainty. And it's through the management of the configurations of relations that we bring about a, 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 a potential of a given landscape of, of possibilities for action. So we see these interventions in systems of knowledge formation as gardening, as processes of um, modulating the couplings, modulating the, 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 the dynamic relations between an entity and, and its environment. And so we're talking about, and I'm starting to show um, some graphs that are going to be, become a bit more complicated from here on, so I hope you can follow. But um, these images are meant to convey this co-dynamic, this co-arising dynamics of the being and its environment, where they de define each other. So we're using the tilde syndrome, sim uh, symbol to convey the notion of complementarity. It was proposed by Scott Kelso, and we've been adopting it. But this still the symbol also contains the coupling that gives rise to this complementary co-arising of both an entity and its environment. So we have the being that is embodied, that acts in a world, in its environment, that brings forth a particular world. It's coupling with its own microenvironment. So we have a wider environment, but actually the environment that's available for us is the one that we are sensitive to, that we are stru structurally coherent with to some extent, and the kind of information that we're capable of, of, of bringing forth or paying attention to. So we have this big E represents the wider environment. The B represents the being, the embodied being, the one that responds in that coupling with its environment, the symbol of complementarity here. And I have an emergent world that is brought forth through this structural coupling, right? 
uh, as this world is brought forth in every um, moment of the coupling, it feeds back on the being and it feeds back on the environment to the extent that this history of structural coupling builds a world where the individual exists. And this wider world is actually a combination of, of micro worlds that might, be, might be come to the fore in different types of situations. And the individual may fluctuate be between these different worlds, but have them available as possibilities for action. So the wider the variety of these worlds we are capable of creating and navigating, the wider are possibilities for action too. So when we're talking about the gardening or interventions uh, in these, we call it environments as a shorthand for this complementarity of being environing, okay? Uh, but this kind of intervention is modulating these coupling processes here while attending to this history of, of structural coupling that represents the world with which the individual comes with. So if you want to, and we're borrowing here uh, that many of you from biology are probably familiar with this kind of image, we're borrowing the notion of epigenetic landscape from Waddington, just to um, portray this notion of a landscape of possibilities for knowing, which represents a landscape of possibilities for being to and for coupling and for environing to some extent or worlding. So we have a set of a mesh, a network of relations that sustain to some extent our universe. And in the beginning of the development of any entity, our landscape of possibilities for action is much wider. You know, we have, we can go in any direction. As we start to develop, constraints start to emerge. So our own emergent worlds and the world that we bring forth through our development starts to constitute constraints for future knowings too. And some pathways become more available and others become less available. And between some of them, we can more easily transition, but others are too distant. And sometimes this landscape is too marked. So in order to increase the possibilities for action of the entity, we either flatten this landscape or we have to increase the energy to have this entity be capable of making these jumps between states in, in this state space of, of possibilities. And so the individual builds this ecological niches only also for, for knowing as part of these configurations of relations that are enacted through its development and through its unfolding through life. So the gardening again happens here, the gardening intervention, and I'm now swifting to the spiral symbol. When I use the spiral, it's the other side of the complementarity symbol and represents the, the, the coupling dynamics, the coupling interactions, the ongoing coupling. The gardening intervention then happens here in this coupling with our immediate microenvironments and in the coupling with the wider microenvironments. But the fact is that in most of our social world, in the biological world, we are not the only entities. So we'll have also these couplings with other entities and they will become part of our environments. So the question is also how do we garden also the coupling with these other entities to either expand or eventually constrain our possibilities for understanding or for action. Um, so what we want is interventions that are capable of modulating this, this landscape of being knowings so that we can have a variety of other states, of, of other worlds emerging and other possibilities for action in it. And as an intervention takes place and different types of variations may take place, different forms of creativity or novelty may come about in this landscape. So this might be in my habitual world, my habitual modes of knowing, the kind of thing that I have available. And through an intervention, some of these spaces might emerge new, that are new, like this star here. Some of these spaces might be lost. Or they might, I have my variation within that space. I'm not really changing my mode of knowing, but somehow I pushed it to the limits and I have slight variations in, in, in those modes of coupling that come with the knowing, or I can have a change in the dynamics or in the topology of arrangement between these, this, this, this configuration of worlds. Ultimately, if the perturbations are significant and under particular conditions, we have not just a, a combination or a variation in this state space, but we have a, a full reconfiguration or transformation of that state space of possibilities itself. Okay, so we have what we would call sort of second order type of, of, of change and, and the particular conditions. So how do we bring about these kind of changes also in inter and transdisciplinary knowings and inter and, uh, and we're gonna be talking about the notion of inter and transdisciplinary abductions and dissolutions as processes also through which we modulate some interactions in this context of, in, of knowledge formation. And elsewhere, I've defined the process of disciplinary or interdisciplinary dissolution. And you can apply this to the dissolution of any epistemic entity uh, in, in a wider context, in a wider environment. So the process of dissolution implies that the entity is embedded 
deeply in, in the context of all the disciplines of our other bodies of knowing that in an exploratory way, it allows these interactions to generate new perspectives or shed light on our own internal organization, that somehow this interaction ends up loosening up the, 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 the tight coupling that we might have uh, with our particular micro environments, allowing for new information to show up. So we can use the interactions to show blind spots to, to, to lead to the emergence of new kinds of embodied experiences and to introduce points of perturbation. But also in the Scylla solution, we actively experiment with a variety of configurations of relations and interactions that again might produce different types of information that then we can use to bring forth different worlds and with it, different types of constructions that we, uh, and different types of uh, concepts or methods or theories or practices. So this process of this solution implies that we become each other's environments that somehow I loosen up a bit my coupling and the constructions that I have on my worlds and allow for other information to emerge that will support different types of coupling with my own micro environments I mean, and my own wider environments. Um, this process of the solution is critical in promoting what we call inter and transdisciplinary abductions, which is pretty much a sort of metamethodological practice through which we generate opportunities for abductive leaps as a form of ampliative and generative type of reasoning from which new hypotheses, new methods, new concepts, new ideas might come about. But this, the solution and this interdisciplinary abductions are dependent on a sort of basic inquisitive and curious stance that has to support an active exploration of our environment, being that environment and uh, uh, the world of another entity, not name of the epistemic world of another entity. And I need a set of strategies and ways of relating that really introduce variation in these ways of coupling with these other entities so that innovative ideas can be brought forth. So this is where environments come in, this kind of interventions where we will be trying to modulate these practices of coupling and understand how can we produce different types of information. So before going in deep, more deeply into what do we mean by an epistemically potent environment and what kind of strategies do we envisage there are a couple of postulates that are important or assumptions that, that underlie our conception of, of environings as interventions in our modulation between being and environing. And one of them is that the more complex the nature of the coupling, the being to its own environing, the being to another being, my world to another world, the more complex the coupling, the more likely it will generate variation, innovation and transformation in these micro identities and micro environments that bring forth different types of worlds and possibilities for action. And that the more complex an entity's own contribution to that coupling relations in terms of the nature, the variety, and the non-linearity of the interaction between a set of cognitive movements, there are embedded, inactive, extended, um, embodied, and then the greater the support and the scaffolding of the environment in performing these complex movements, the more likely this variation will, will, will take place and will lead to innovation and to transformation, right? And ultimately to abductive leaps and to creative outcomes, even in conditions of high uncertainty. So what we are assuming is that under certain conditions when we have a sufficiently complex coupling, we might have information emerging from interactions that might guide our actions even when we don't have the full information about the environment around. We are kind of like guided by that coupling relationship. And this brings us to complex thinking. What do we mean by these complex couplings? Um, and, and, and the complex thinking um, concept is, is grounded in the studies of complexity science and of complex systems, and particularly in the contribution of Edgar Morin and his notion of, of, of pensée complex, of the complex thinking. But it comes from an attempt to make this operational. How do I practice more complex forms of thinking? And we define it from an inactive perspective of cognition as both a process and an outcome of a coupling between a given entity and a target system of interest. And as a process, it is a process that not just attends to, describes and adjusts to what we now recognize as properties of complex biological and social systems. And this would fall into what I would call complexity thinking, but it also enacts such properties in the coupling relationship, in the coupling process. And this is what I call complex thinking. It's the performance of these properties that we see underlying organizing living systems that we perform in our thinking movements in the coupling with other systems through our embodiment. And as an outcome 
Complex thinking in principle will allow a wider variety of descriptions, explanations, anticipations, and the production of differences as pieces of information that will make a difference in organizing uh, the co-evolution of an entity with its ecosystem and, 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 and the producing a more meaningful information to make that coupling more coherent and, and, and constructive. So I'm not going to go into this, but I'm just showing you this is a, a description of a set of dimensions and properties that this framework proposes, properties that we could try to enact that characterize both uh, natural and social systems that we could try to enact in our coupling with a target system of interest and in the context of an inter and transdisciplinary intervention to, to, to generate these varieties of information. The ones that are marked are the ones that I hypothesize to be more critical, their interaction is more critical for, for us to, 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 to have emergent outcomes or creative outcomes. Okay? I'll come back to this later on with examples. I'm just giving you the, the, the framework. So to some extent, these properties of thinking are just mental movements or movements in my coupling with my microenvironments that bring forth particular worlds. So in a world of you know, noise, these, these movements allow us to create some side of information. And so we construct our world and our systems of interest in particular ways. The combination of these properties would lead to more complex constructions. We have a, 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 a much bigger amount of dimensions, for example, here than we have there. Okay, I can see circles and triangles and, and depth and colors. So I can bring forth different types of worlds. Now, what the framework proposes is that the interaction between these properties in particular circumstances will lead not just to what, more richer constructions immediately, but to abductive leaps. There's a point where information is just going to emerge as a property of the complexity of the coupling relationship that will then guide me further on in my interaction and generate the information that I need to adjust and to have effective actions in the world or more positive, for example, interventions in the case of an intervener that's trying to understand a given system of interest. So what does this have to do with epistemically potent environments? We define, and I'm going to start defining a bit or laying down the foundations of what we call epistemically potent environments. We're saying that these environments support and scaffold the performance of these complex thinking movements and their coupling dynamics within and between entities and their levels of organization through supporting embodied, enacted, extended, embedded practices, namely by supporting our embodied explorations of our wider environments, including each other and ourselves through our embodied experiences about building knowledge from our body, from our experience. Supporting enacted practices and offering conditions for, um, that include our exploration of the space and acting in space that brings forth information, but also the physical manipulation of our mental worlds, of our mental concepts and our constructs. Uh, Barbara Tversky talks about a cycle that she calls this spraction. It's a spiral of action through which our movements in space give rise to our abstractions. But then once these abstractions are constructed, we also construct gestures and how gestures allow us to manipulate and scaffold complex abstract movements. So our movement in space is not just in the material world, it can also scaffold the kind of mental constructions that we can, that, that we can perform. And I'm moving my hands deliberately, okay, because the gestures, as um, Golden Meadow has showed, have, are, are particularly important in manipulating and shaping the dynamics of the thinking. And then these contexts provide a rich embeddedness. Okay? They, they support the exploration as well as the interaction between a variety of social cultural environments and cultural mediators. They provide artifacts for the, for the exploration of other worlds. They pay attention to the cultural barriers. They clarify protocols for cultural mediation but also allowing a space where we can lose the norms and our cultural protocols in order to explore each other through those embodied and enacted practices in a different way in each other's worlds, which are sustained in our cultures. But they also offer extended support. So this idea that our cognitive processes are not inside our skull, are not inside our brain, are not just inside the limits of our body, but they are extended to our environment. So epistemically potent environments offer tools and strategies to scaffold these more complex mental movements through embodied practices and for managing also the emergent environments that come from the interaction between individuals, which will have their own properties and might augment the individual capacities also for performing these, these, these movements. 
Furthermore, these, because uh, in, in these interactions and in the coupling, where we are focusing is in the modulation, is in, in the new worlds that are brought forth by the, the changing of the configurations of relations, but also in the levels that are constructed. I have different entities interacting, and then I have collective entities interacting, for example, a group that will have its own dynamic, its own properties, its own worlds being constructed and will feed back at the level of the individual. This environment provides reflexive attention and strategies for managing these processes of transformation, for paying attention to these transitions, to that which happens in between and not just to the outcome. So we're modulating those transformations and those variations in that wide space of possibilities for action or knowing. And so they offer also contributions to support the integration of a variety of modes of, um, of expressions of complex couplings, and they support these processes that I've mentioned of inter-epistemic dissolution or even interbeing dissolution. And I'll, I'll, I'll explore this a bit later. Um, finally, they support the emergence of an environment from the sense of an ambiance of trust and safety, because these are processes of deep transformation, these processes of complex knowings and they imply perturbation. They will imply when we are transitioning between worlds or between attractors in that state space, there will be senses of confusion. We, we certainly feel that we don't know anything anymore, that the world is not as we experienced anymore. We don't have the answers available. This can be quite frightening. So there's a context of uncertainty, there's a context of perturbation, of disorientation, which might correspond to that edge of chaos in complex systems, which is also the place of complexity and where interesting things can happen and where new worlds can be brought forth. But it is necessary to hold this space of uncertainty, to hold this perturbation instead of just shutting it away because that's not normally what we do when it's uncomfortable. So an epistemically potent environment is designed to help us hold those status and provide a safe and trusting environment where we can do this and expose ourselves uh, also to the other participants in that environment. And so it offers also emotional support and scaffolding to manage and these emotional experiences. But above all, like I said, it attends to the potential of that which lies in between, the scaffolding of the interactions between levels and the management of the emergent levels at each moment that they, that they show up and how they can feed back to the, to, the lower, to the lower levels. So how do we nurture these kind of environments and how do we bring about uh, epi um, complex knowings and interesting results in terms of creativity and abduction? We are um, starting, to, like I said, to modulate this relationship between entities, this interaction, and between, uh, and we're adding another environment, which is an intervention environment. So this orange, every time you see orange from now on, that represents an intervention. And this is now the intervention environment that has other observers, in that case, what I'm calling the intervener, which is also an entity with their own worldviews, with their own microenvironments, and it's also going to shape that state, that, that landscape of possibilities for knowing. What we are saying is that the more complex knowing will emerge from this coherence between the processes that organize biological systems, that organize life and our mental world or our, our cognitive systems, our minds. Okay? So we're aligning with all of those authors that have been looking for this pattern that connects mind and life. And we're saying that this will happen through the practice of what we call complex thinking as, as, as described before. So we have here an entity with its history of structural coupling, which is this big W of the world, uh, in the dynamic coupling with its microenvironment that's also shaped by the history of structural couplings. I have expectations when I get into an environment. I select particular types of information. I have patterns that just recur. And so the same kind of worlds can are, are come to the front every time. And that's how we have this illusion of stability in our worlds because of this recurrence, because everything actually is constantly changing and it's dynamic. But this entity has an interest, okay? This could be this, my system of interest could be a community that I'm trying to develop an intervention with, could be a research question, could be a problem, whatever whatever you want it to be. And this entity couples, couples normally with this problem in their, I'm calling habitual environment, this H. Now we're bringing this entity into a designed intervention, which is this orange space, where, with an intervener that's going to try to disturb this coupling. And this is the kind of context that we will be focusing on when we kind of create this purposely designed environments, for example, for inter or transdisciplinary teams to work for particular periods of time. But you can have something different too, which is bring the intervention to the natural environment. And ideally, we have 
a combination between, between these movements in and out. So we kind of like modulate the coupling by, provide, by scaffolding, providing strategies or coaching the entities to make particular contributions in that coupling relationship. Now, the, the complex knowings evolve in a spiral of continuous differentiation and integration and emergence of new levels and emergence of, of, of new worlds. And, and so the complex interventions and the environments have to follow this pathway. So it's a sort of unfolding process that supports these emergent couplings through these epistemically potent environments. So this process here, there are, um, implies a certain number of key conditions like the ones that I described before. And the basic ingredients are the, the, the four E practices, right? the embodied, inactive, embedded, extended practices that support complex couplings defined as I have by the enactment of those properties of complex systems in context of high reflexivity that attends to this minor transformation within levels, but also between levels, which is where the realities, where the worlds start to shift. And we propose a circular process that is not linear and, 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 and many of these stages will interpenetrate each other, but we have to start somewhere. We we're gonna talk to you about a, a potential intervention and how we would design it and what kind of stages we would go through. And the first one would build building this common grounding. Okay. So now I have two entities in this intervention environment that you see here. And my first stage of intervention is really about disturbing that first landscape of possibilities for action, but providing a ground for new types of coupling to be able to be, to, to be constructed. So we have a system where an intervention here that's targeting the way that the entity relates to their own worlds. These worlds are full of know-hows, intuitive knowledges, personal knowledges, tacit knowledge that are just brought, supported by the recurrences of these couplings and, and we don't even know them. But when we, when we face new situations, we might need new different types of know-hows. We might need to reprocess that and to build a new world that then becomes tacit again. But a lot of these constructions also imply concepts and theories and abstractions that we built and they are now shaping the kind of interactions that I have with my micro environments. So this is a movement where we help individuals externalize their worlds, externalize the constructions and also externalize that which might be implicit, but also connect with this embodied foundation with the level of the experience where from where uh, new worlds emerge in the coupling with the environment. So, so, so it's, it's, it's the that the embodied experience that needs to be attended to and the individual needs to be reflected. And also to the nature of how they bring about a particular system of interest. So the intervention targets this. But I have two entities and they might need to construct, to build some shared construction of a shared system of interest because they need to work together and they might be able to do, to, to build a more complex construction. So these entities can also interact at different levels. They can interact at this more being to being. And again, I'm talking about the sort of immediate experience, embodied experience, pre-reflective experience where we kind of like sense each other, feel each other. They can interact through their worlds, which includes also not just their know-hows, but their concepts, their theories, their worldviews, but they can also interact and they, they will interact in a novel environment. Now, the challenge is to make this environment shared that this micro environment that they build out of the wider environment is shared enough and they're synchronized enough that a shared world can emerge. Otherwise they will stay in their individual worlds even when we are in an apparently same type of environment. Sometimes the intervention can be done through the coupling of the worlds and Charvo has some work on partial overlaps, for example, of worldviews, right? So, so we can explore the, the notions where our world somehow overlap and work through that. But in many occasions, the distinctions are too big and too wide to be, to be bridged. And this is where it's useful to bring forth common worlds. And this has to be done from the ground up through the foundations of our cognitive processes. So we propose a common grounding stage, which is about letting people be together, feel together and build a common environment without those concepts, without those theories, without those constructions. And many of you may think that we do this intuitively when we have teams with which we've worked for long times and we go off for coffee, you know, and in the end of the day, we just hang out and we play together and we share experiences. And there's a lot going on in our, in our coupling relationship that's not just about work. And, that's, and that builds a foundation for us to coordinate in a more easier way, for example, and then to build shared understandings. But there might be even more than that that can be built. And for example, if you come to a particular intervention, I could have you coupling at the biological level, for example, through motor synchronization. 
The work, for example, Scott Kelso has shown how synchronization and coordination is like a basic law from, from the level of the cell to the level of the coordination of our brains. And, and that kind of synchronization brings different types of levels and different possibilities for action. So the physical coordination, for example, between these entities could allow for the emergence of a shared, of a shared world. I could have you going on walks together and have your pace uh, synchronize or a couple through silent walks where you don't walk through, you're not talking through with, with words, but you're kind of like just sensing the other and trying to make sense of what's happening between you. Or I might have you build a shared environment and do things together, act together in a shared environment, play a game, make a task again, put the, the, the motor synchronization in place so that slowly a shared world starts to emerge. And as this shared world emerges, so does another entity which is the we, which is the group, which is another a collective entity that will have its own possibilities for action, its own potentialities, its own, its own worlds, and will interact with the level of the individual shaping them too. So now I start to have different types of constructions also of this target system of interests. And my intervention here is in modulating this coupling between the entities at these different levels, okay? And, and as they do, I have a collective we that's emerging, and under particular circumstances that I won't have time to detail, this we might have top-down effects that have the effect of augmenting my cognitive capacities too as an individual, okay? So it's for action. Now, the tricky thing is that in, normally in group context, the group level tends to take over or the individual level tends to take over. But it is really in the crossing and the combination of the landscapes of potentiality that why the possibilities for action emerge. So the tricky thing is to be attentive to when the group level is operating or when the individual level is operating and combining those possibilities in a dynamic way, avoiding the system to just lock in one mode and to stop generating uh, sufficiently rich differences. Um, so these are just examples, for example, of interventions that could take place here. I put an example, for example, of Bohm dialogues. I don't know if anyone uh, have, have heard of this dialogical practices proposed by David Bohm, the physicist. But there are practices, for example, where the group attends to the emergent entity, which is the group, and, and to the kind of experiences and is driven by that. So there are practices that allows us to attend to the group level. There are practices that come from more Eastern or even indigenous traditions that might allow us to connect with our embodied time connection with, with the world and with each other, or meditative or contemplative practices that might, or phenomenological practices that might allow us to attend to the nature of our world using our constructions, for example. So they're just examples of strategies. Now, I won't have time to go through this, but in our complex thinking framework that I mentioned before, in each of these stages, some of those properties are going to be more salient. And there are strategies that I can use to scaffold the enactment of those properties at this stage of the environment process. For example, practices that allows us to generate variety of information of all kinds, cognitive, emotional, behavior, that allow us to keep building relations and exploring different types of connection between the bits of information that emerge, and also to make recursive loops and revisiting these bits of information, because it is in the combination of these three properties at least that emergence will take place. But also that strategies, for example, that allow us to couple with different timescales, the time scale of the individual, the time scale of the group, the time scale of the development of an idea in the moment, the temporal states of the mind that might bring about disruptions too in that, in that landscape of possibilities for knowing or in the emergent worlds. The promotion of reflexivity, scenario games, role play games, nonverbal sculptures that allows us to build a shared environment, even in relation to the way that we are constructing our target system of interest and to build a shared construction. Okay. So just to give you an example, I work with teams of practitioners, and oftentimes when we start discussing a case of intervention, I ask them to show me their relationship with the case, but not to tell me about the case. And they might have Play-Doh, they might have Legos, I ask them to enact or to perform or to show me something that's not at the level of the concepts, but, but shows that relationship and how they're building, and sometimes allows them to pay attention to different dimensions of that coupling, that I hadn't seen before and information that they hadn't used in explicitly constructing their world. So we're, we're allowing for new information to be generated through these more embodied experiences. And then the, 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 the next stage would be what we call serious playful explanation. It's taking play very, very seriously. So it's about building playgrounds for us to explore each other's worlds, each other's ideas, each other's building these shared environments, but also to explore our target systems of interests, okay? 
So this playground is really a playground where we play, like I said, with ideas, with our bodies, where we move around. And this is the total contrary to what we normally do in our meetings, where we're sitting, even, especially here in Zoom, you know, we're sitting and we're looking at a little square and we're barely even moving. But it's about bringing forth different types of information through the movement in space. And with that, building the shared constructions about our target system of interest. And we can alternate in this mode between the playground and what we call the, gym, the gymnasium mode, which is you have an environment that allows you to go deeper into some of these pro properties of complex thinking and to really practice them so that you can experiment these new ways of approaching the world of, of, of modulating uh, your coupling with your environment or your contributions to this coupling and then generating different types of information. And again, we have uh, interventions that, are that, that take place at the individual level, but also in the interaction between the individuals. Now, the critical point here is this R that I put here, which is the reflexivity. It's again to understand in these explorations, what is the nature of the novelty that's emerging? And at what levels is it emerging? Is it in my individual constructions? Is it something that the whole group is capable of grasping or seeing or sharing? So we need reflexive terms and reflexive movements and reflexive strategies embedded to notice the perturbations in that landscape that I showed you in the beginning, the landscape of possibilities, because oftentimes those perturbations just slide away. You have a fluctuation, you have a micro wall emerging, but it's kind of like it disappears because the dominant worlds take place. So if we don't have enough reflexivity to understand the potential of that new information, it will be lost. And in the context of groups, this often happens. You have a new idea that's just dismissed. You know, you have a new experience that you, that you treat as noise instead of a, a, a source of information or a source of creativity. So we need reflexive strategies. And this could be um, having, for example, reflecting teams couple with research teams or inter- and transdisciplinary teams, observing the processes, feeding back in the end of the meetings. But it could also have people in the, in the role of observers or having reflexive strategies like keeping diarogues or, or using videos, for example, and reviewing the video together of the meeting and trying to notice the small perturbations, the small moments where something different happened that we could have built upon and we didn't because we just let it go. Or we did and how did it go and what was the outcome in terms of that emergent experience. So we're taking play very seriously here. And then the next stage would be what we call the workshopping mode. Okay, we have a variety of information emerging and different possibilities. Not all of them are going to work, but some ideas seem promising. So this is when we go deep. Instead of go wide, we go deep into those ideas and then again explore different modalities of coupling in refining the constructions that we make, not just of our ways of mode of working together and interacting, but the constructions that we make of our target system of interest. And then we start to map. And we start to understand that system of interest in the context of a wider environment too in mapping its relations. Um, and this is important because the next stage is the ecosystemic fitting or the narrating stage. These constructions, in, at, by this time, when I look at this environment, the individuals are not the same. The group is a different one and it has created another world. And not on rare occasions, this world is at odds with the world out there. You go talk to other people and they just have no idea what you're talking about because you have an experience that they can't connect with. Or you just build a vision of a system that you want to intervene with that no one else recognizes. So if we can't make these novelties fit in a wider landscape of relations, they are going to die or they're going to generate problems or blockages. This happens a lot. I see Leticia nodding because we work a lot with practitioners with types of training where they go through deep transformations and then they have to deal with other teams, with other practitioners, with, with go back to their realities. And they often say, we don't know what to do anymore because it, we feel like the world has changed and but everyone else is the same and, and we can't fit into this environment. So a complex and epistemically potent environment has to provide these strategies to bridge these worlds that are generated individually in the group context with the world out there if you want to or the worlds of others. And this is the time also to bring different types of strategies. On the first hand, to do what you could call systemic mapping or even participatory systems mapping of how you now conceive your system of interest and to what extent there are connections with the constructions that others would make, for example, in a community context. This is the time when you bring external reflexive partners. There could be people, different observers from the community, different stakeholders, different agents, different disciplines, different perspectives that come and 
do a sort of fitness evaluation of our worlds of our constructions, but this also means that we might have to build a bridging world so they can enter our worlds and we can and we can show them. But this is also where we do a sort of ethical and aesthetical assessment of the consequences of our worlds and our constructions. What are the effects of these worlds and these practices and these transformations? To what extent are they compatible with the values of the people around? And also how do we build narratives and stories that consolidate and sustain those configurations of relations that hold the worlds that we find more favorable? But it's also about spreading seeds because sometimes the constructions that we do are not quite fit there for the world, but we have changed and we are gonna go back into our environments and we're gonna do things differently. And we're gonna generate new worlds in the coupling with other entities. So the epistemic political environment it needs to allow also for these strategies of seedling or spreading seeds of disseminating other modes of interacting that, that can then change. Uh, so we have a more transformative um, landscape uh, uh, or ecology being worked about. And again, there are different strategies. This is where you might come with collective storytelling, with appreciative audiences, for example, with strategies where you come and you have people uh, exploring our ideas and giving feedback. When we have pragmatic evaluations, there could be sensing techniques, mapping techniques, all sorts of things. But it's the fitness now of these different constructions and the role of these external observers that we find interesting. So it's in this cycle of interactions and movements that complex knowings are formed, dissolved, reconstructed, transformed, as our couplings with our environments change and new worlds and micro worlds emerge and hopefully shared worlds emerge. There are a couple of challenges in this, a lot of things that we don't understand, for example, how, why, and which configurations of relations within and between levels, contents, methods, timescales, and contexts lead to particular types of creativity, for example, innovation, transformation, uh, variation. What is the nature of the specific relations that is created that sustain epistemically more potent environments? And which strategies best support different types of coupling in terms of that complex thinking coupling? But also there's a, a, a wider challenge, which is what, how do we build a culture that supports these environments and complex knowings? And address challenges as this, how do we integrate the whole person in the process of knowledge formation? While science, for example, excludes the role of the observer, traditional science excludes the role of the observer, excludes the role. We have loads of technologies to work with the world out there, but we have very little technologies to work with the person that is producing the knowledge and that will, through their couplings, bring forth and be capable of generating different types of information or more or less creative outcomes in, 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 in moving in their worlds. So how can we integrate practices that exist from Easter, from indigenous practices or other epistemic traditions? There are practices of being, of, of coupling with ourselves and with working with our experiences that could help us become more complex knowers. How can we build rich, richer connections with our environments of interest out there in the world? How can we create the times? Because this implies a slow science. This implies slow interactions. This kind of complex knowings are not going to come out in a one hour meeting that a big consortium has, you know, that meets every month. Because there's no time for coalescence of, of, of a group. There's no time for emergence. There's no time to, for playful experimentation. We end up more normally at the best with small variations of the same theme. You know, we add a bit, but that's the lowest end of the creative uh, process, not, not, not the highest, not even the, the, you know, the interesting one. Uh, so how do we create this time, but also how do we create a knowledge base and these spaces and the expertise and the conditions like facilities or funding to um, work and, and promote this kind of epistemically potent environments when we conduct our research, for example. And some people have been, talking about this notion of having accompanying teams or reflexive teams. They're not the teams that are doing the research, but there are the teams that are facilitating key processes in the knowledge formation. And in companies, for example, organizations, businesses, facilitation is the usual thing. It's not so much still in science. So we need to create and train facilitators in, in of, of, of epistemically potent environments. But also how do we create a culture that's capable of holding and sustaining and playing with that uncertainty, with that novelty, with that discomfort, and with that perturbation that comes when you are transitioning between states and when new worlds are being brought forth. So 
this is the challenge also of working towards not just the science of what is, but assuming that we can have a science of possibilities, a science of what can be, as through our practices and through our actions, and probably this is easier to do or to start to do in context of action research, we bring forth different worlds. We're not just mapping the world as it is. We are supporting and working and becoming a part of those transformations. So it's a shift from the technological development, the computational algorithms, the sophisticated uh, models, mathematical models, to the sophistication of our practices of relating to each other, of being, environing, of worlding together. And we would like to thank all the epistemically potent environments in which we have participated. Um, yeah, the York Cross Disciplinary Center has been one of them. The team of the Building Foundations for Complex Thinking, Leticia is, is here with us today and the, all the conversations that we had, workshops that we had with, with other collaborators like Charvel that have participated and it also influenced our thinking, the history of our relations and our um, worlds, but also a future vision that we have about places and contexts and where we can actually perform these things and, and help and nurture these kind of environments. And that's the vision that's guiding us. So thank you. This is part of the Complex Thinking, Building Foundations for Complex Thinking project, if anyone wants to take a look.